And in Scotland, if the tradition is from Japan, but in Scotland, the tradition goes back to the ancient Celtic times before the arrival of Christianity. And they're usually found near sacred sh shrines. And the strips of cloth can represent hopes and prayers. And so needless to say, I put a couple up for myself. And here we have uh, Glasgow Cathedral, a uh, little shot of the interior. It was a beautiful, beautiful cathedral, and they have tombs down below, um, which were also very interesting. Many chapels still underneath in the tomb area. And to the right, uh, I mean the left at the top, you've got the Glasgow coat of arms. And you can see that in the center picture. Um, it's often, uh, but they're often seen around the city in many, many different places. And there's a lot of wall art in Glasgow, and there are a, a few pieces of it. Um, the two ones on the right uh, were at the, the University of Strathclyde. Um, it, which is in the center of Glasgow, as is the one in the center that's also University of uh, Strathclyde. And then we go from there to Edinburgh, and um, I guess highlights for me, the bottom sign at the left is at the airport, so I saw that was one of the first things I saw when I came to Scotland. Um, and the top left sign, you'll see Water of Leith Walkway. I was staying in Leith, and I mistakenly thought I could walk from the center of town to Leith. I might have been able to do it if I wasn't schlepping suitcases in a backpack. <laughs> and then the Royal Mile, the High Street, is a main area that I'll be talking about. Princess Street is the demarcation line between the old town and the new town. And then you have Cowgate, um, which is a, a street through which they used to run cattle. And um, it now is a street which you take to get to the National Museum of Scotland. Edinburgh Waverley is the sign for the railway station. And here we have, if you look um, at the tower that's just in the smack dab in the middle, that is on Prince's Street, and that's the Scott Monument. And to the left, you can see Edinburgh Castle, and you follow that down, and to the right, you'll see Holyrood Palace. And that's where the Queen stays um, when she is in uh, Edinburgh. And down at the bottom right-hand corner is um, Arthur's Seat. And I did climb that, and we'll talk a little bit about that. This is the station, Waverly Station, as we came in. And I've shown you the picture of the train and the juxtaposed to Edinburgh Castle. And when I came in, it was quite light. And all of a sudden, it was dark. And I looked up, and I thought, what am I looking at? And we were looking straight up those rocks, and that's the same volcanic kind of rock that Dunstaffage Castle was built on. Um, and here, I'm on my walk to Leith, and I met some giraffes. Right in the middle of the city, it was raining, um, as you can see. And I walked quite a bit farther before I got discouraged and got out of us. And this is a little map of the Water of Leith Converse Conservation Trust. It's where the ships came in. It was the dock where the, um, the girls were on the dock for the sailors. And if you look at this, there's a down in the middle picture at the bottom, you'll see a tower, I mean a, a lighthouse. And at the top, the picture on the top right, You'll see the same lighthouse, and just at the bottom balcony there was where I was staying. Um, I considered it to be amazing, an amazing place to stay. It's one of those areas of town that is being developed. Um, the top left picture is called the shore, and if you walk along the right-hand side of the shore, you'll come back to that tower, to the lighthouse tower, and then the bottom picture in the middle is looking from the back of that 
along the shore, but in a di different direction. And if you see the sign here, George V Rex, he landed and stepped foot, fourth time, Daddy, Daddy, pardon, can't read that, he stepped foot on the shore, just, and you see the blue building in the middle picture, on, I mean the left picture in the top left hand corner, just walk along there a little ways and he stepped his foot on the shore and that's where that sign is. And this little bench down at the bottom right hand corner is just beside that um, lighthouse and I sat there while I waited for my host to arrive at 8 o'clock at night. And there's the bench and you're looking at uh, a bridge to cross over to go towards where Britannia is. And that was one of the bird life that was in the water often. Now this was really interesting. When I came here, I didn't realize what this was, but it's the former Siemens Mission, and it's now a Mal Mason Hotel. And, oh, again, we're looking down. Now, we have the sailors' home, and they actually had rooms for each rink, a canteen, a low-cost clothing shop, rec rooms, and a chapel. So an innovation in social care at a time when many workers lived in overcrowded slums. The bottom left right hand picture is an old one and the top one is current and above the doorway is an angel. So in the, yes, the flying, the flying well it's not flying but, but there you have an angel. And this is a memorial that's right in the middle of that square. And uh, it was it was very, very interesting to me. It's a memorial to the seamen. And at the top of it, on the top left, you can see Viking ships on the top. And then all the activity on every side and places that the, the sailors would go. So a memorial to sailors. Um, everywhere. And in the sidewalk along the North Shore, all this graffiti, and I'll just read one. Um, for that barrel to the wine bond, cart gunpowder safely, stack the timber, bring the hemp and tallow ashore, our whiskey is cast and ready. <laughs> So it was really interesting to be able to walk along and just see some of these signs that were actually right in the sidewalk. And then there was an in inscription stone in the water of Leith Pathway. So with the darkest days behind, our ship of hope will steer, and when in doubt, just keep in mind our motto, persevere. It's good, eh? It's really neat. And then, um, the next day I went off to Britannia, and on my way to Britannia, I had to pass this complex. It was built in 1962, known as the Banana Flats. Cable's Wine House is most famous as the home of Sick Boy in Irvin Welsh's train spotting. So if any of you saw that. And it's very interesting to go online and take a look at the inside of some of these places, or this place in particular. So the City of Edinburgh Council owns 198 of the 203 flats in the building. And the Britannia is at the Ocean Terminal. The Ocean Terminal is a mall. And they've got many, many, many different shops in the mall. And you make your way through and you end up in at the Ocean, at the Britannia. And this ship was named in 1953. And the interesting thing is, is that the Britannia is supported by the staff of 20 officers and 220 yachtsmen. And so they had accommodation on board for all of those. And as you were going to board the ship, they had many, many posters. And I was delighted to see that they had excluded Princess Diana. Uh, and that, of course, is an amazing picture of her greeting her kids. Um, probably one that is well known. And there she is, very elegant. And here's the bridge. Uh, and you notice there's only one chair for the Admiral and his cabin. 
And this is a his and hers, um, Philip and Elizabeth. And Elizabeth's study. And the aft deck, the dining room above, is now open to the public. That wasn't closed in on the original ship. So you can have high tea there if you wish. I had had lunch, so I didn't. But it looked very um, welcoming. This is the royal dining room. And um, a sample of the silverware, uh, and there were many cupboards with lots and lots of china, and one place setting, and I apologize, it's under focus, but apparently um, the service people would measure the position of every piece on, the, on every place setting. So everything had to be exact. That's the grand staircase, and that's the reception room um, on the Britannia. And here we have, if you take, go from the top left corner, just walking along an outside deck, it would be really good to do a walk or a run. Um, those are uh, cruise quarters, and the, the top right, we're getting into the laundry room area, and below the pressing area. And the top two, I mean the bottom two pictures are um, the operating room and a hospital bed. So the, the ship is self-sufficient. And this is the tender. Um, I think it's about, I would say, 30 to 35 feet long. And that, that's just an example of some of the decoration uh, on the top left there. And <coughs> there were uh, gangways to get onto the boat, and they were always red. Um, indicating, of course, that's where the royal family would board the boat. And this is the engine room. And just a little story about this. Apparently, um, they had some American Admiralty visitors aboard the boat, and uh, they brought him to this room, and he said, okay, so where's the real thing? It was so clean, that he couldn't believe that the engine room wasn't dirty, and, but that's how they kept it. And alongside the Britannia is the Bloodhound, a 12 meter. It's the Royal Yacht Squadron, founded in 1815, um, and this boat has been around since um, that time, and the first Cow's Week was in 1826. And Princess Anne is a patron to, or a member of, over 20 sailing and yachting associations. And so there you've got a few. Um, I took the bottom three pictures. The top one came from a display that is in the, uh, in the ship, uh, which demonstrates uh, the history of the Bloodhound and racing that the royal family has done. The Bloodhound went into disrepair and was purchased by Tony and Cindy McRail in 2003, and they restored it to its current beauty. And then there's a little boat called the Tui, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, and this is the boat on which um, the young royals were trained. Uh, and so they began sailing at a very, very early age, so it's not surprising that they're very, very interested in sailing. And so now let's go to Edinburgh. And there's that same map I showed you before, just to reorient you. And here we have the Royal Mile in Scotland. The Royal Mile runs from the castle, the Edinburgh Castle, to Holyrood, um, the Holyrood Palace. And so you can see there where the walk is. It was crowded while I was there. Here is looking up at the castle again, and this is looking at the castle from a different vantage point. I did not take that picture at the right. One of the places I visited was a shop where you could buy everything plaid, and below in the basement they were weaving plaid. The machines were so loud, if you can look at that fellow, he's got earphones on protecting his ears from the noise. 
Um, we were, it wasn't so bad upstairs, but you could definitely hear uh, as that went. And there was a lot of, uh, there were a lot of street performers, um, and they ranged from a bagpiper to a violinist to a witch who wasn't touching the floor. And I don't know if you recall, but when I was in Norway in Oslo, I saw such a, a phenomenon. Still don't know how they create that illusion. And there were a lot of closes or winds, W-Y-N-D, along the Royal Mile. And I'm taking you into one here. If you look at the picture on the left, you can see that the traffic of people at the, through the, the corridor. But you come through that corridor to a piece. It's incredibly noisy on the street. And you come in through the, the close, and it's very peaceful. And you've got these lovely apartments overlooking this beautiful piece of sculpture and a little garden. Um, and then there were, were a couple of parking spots back there as well. And through another close, Lady Stairs close, is the Writers Museum. And on the east side of that close, Robert Burns lived when he was visiting. And the museum itself is dedicated to Stevenson, Scott, and Burns. And you can see that digital reproduction of their faces on the top right. Um, if you look through the close, you can see the Writers Museum um, sign uh, sitting up there. And Lady Stair is the person who purchased the building and restored it, so it is now a museum today. And these uh, quotes are on in the pavement in that square through the close. You go a little farther down and you'll see Hume, the philosopher, and behind him, St. Giles Church. The picture on the right is looking from the back of the church, looking up at the tower. And here we have Hume again. You can see his toes are very shiny. Everybody touches them. And this is the interior of the church. And I just had to take a picture of the ceiling, the Gothic ceiling, and it was breathtaking, totally breathtaking. And then a little farther along the street is John Knox House, and there were three people who were involved in that house, Mary, Queen of Scots, um, John Knox himself, and James Mossman, the goldsmith. And this house is uh, kind of juts into the street, and you can see it today as it is today, and then in below as it was before. And here's some of the interior of this house. Um, the goldsmith desk there, or a workplace, and the pictures on the left bottom and the, t and the right are the ceiling of the room in the bottom center, um, as it is today on the right, and as it was when it was originally built. So quite beautiful and amazing. And then looking out on the street, and as you look through that window, you can see St. Giles. And going a little farther down is the Canongate Kirk interior, and outside it, John Robertson, a bohemian poet. This church is the church that services Holyrood Castle, so this is where the Queen will go when she's in residence. And here we have uh, Holyrood Castle on. Uh, excuse me. So you have the Queen's Gallery, and you go in there, and it's basically a shop like anywhere you would have any any museum. The gates on the left are, um, as you're looking at the picture on the right, they would be to the left. And the bottom right is uh, the back entrance to the restaurant that is now attached. And it's a delightful place to have lunch there. And across the street from Holyrood is the Parliament Building. And the Parliament Buildings are interesting. Um, you've got an entrance there at the top left corner. And <coughs> Oh, 
And that same entrance on the right was part of the building. And those, the center picture is the back of the building. The left bottom picture is if you were to walk around to the right at the top right picture, <coughs> you would end up seeing yet again more quotes. And then the bottom right is where the public can enter. And so if you look at that, it's much more secure, if you will, than the front entrance. Although, if you went in the front entrance, I'm not sure what it would be like. And here's Coburn Street. Um, and in Coburn Street, you have another kind of close, which is a huge staircase. I did not climb that. But I walked from Coburn Street, I mean, from the, the Royal Mile, down Coburn Street to Prince's Street. And here we have Scott's Monument. So Sir Walter Scott, and you can actually climb to the top of that if you want. I didn't. <coughs> and here we have Arthur's Seat. And Arthur's Seat is 250 meters high. The people who are coming down here are coming down the front of the mountain. I did not climb that area. If you look here, you can see at the bottom center, you can see the Scottish Parliament and Holyrood uh, Palace. And follow the dotted red line. <coughs> and those, that's the route I took up. And that was in itself challenging enough. It doesn't look so bad. Those are some of the things that I went up on. But there, you can see some of the, uh, the road up. Um, the one on the, OK, here we are. This is the top at the bottom here, and the, the bottom picture on the left. And that, um, the angle of climb was about 35 degrees all the way up until you got to here. And then it kind of steepened up. And as I was going up, and all fours, hands, feet, there were kids who were leaping from rock to rock. <laughs> oh my god, am I going to get there? I was so lucky, though, I met a woman at the bottom, and I was telling her what I was going to do. And she said, um, you will get to a point where you're, you're sure you're not going to make it, but keep going. You will. And I was so glad I had that little bit of courage. And there I am at the top, and up the bottom right is a picture of a uh, family. And I met this little guy, and they were, he was going up with his parents, and, oh no, I can't make it, and they were so encouraging. And then coming down, I met them again, and again, really, really encouraging. And so when we got to this point and we're sitting down for lunch, they came along, can I join you, of course. And he says to me, James, his name is, he says, I have a Henley, you know. And his mother said, she might not know what a Henley is. And he said, well, I have a thing in my brain. And because I have that, I have to wear this brace on my foot. And he pulled his pant leg up, and he had a, quite a substantial brace on his foot. And he had said to his parents that morning, I want to climb Arthur's seat today. And it was a Sunday, and they said, OK, OK. I was so impressed with their encouragement, and, their, and they really encouraged. They did not, um, they encouraged him to do it on his own with their support. But they didn't give him a hand. It was, oh, no, you can do it. You can make it down. Just put your foot in, and that kind of comment. And so this little boy is very, very lucky to have these two people as his parents. <clears throat> and there we are at the top. And you know you've reached the top because you reach this silver disc. And I, you can see my hand there taking a picture, 250 meters in the lap and the long. I made it to the top. I thought that was pretty good considering my two knee replacements. I thought, never will I get there. And then I took a trip on a bus, and the bus took us to Rosslyn Chapel. And the interesting thing about Rosslyn Chapel is this column. 
and I forget what it's called, and you have a hanging boss there that's up in the ceiling with a, a six-pointed star at the bottom. <coughs> but the column, the master mason went on a trip to find out about different kinds of columns, and the he left behind a junior, and the owner of the, the person who was having the chapel built uh, talked to him, and the guy said, I think I can do it, I have an idea. And so he built this column, and then the master mason returned. And the master mason's nose was totally out of joint, and he murdered the junior mason. <clears throat> and so he was charged, executed himself. And what they did in the chapel was they built a picture in stone of the junior mason looking at his creation. And the master mason was looking at the junior mason. So what they said is that the, ma the master mason has to look at what he did all his, all his life in the chapel. So it was a very, very interesting place. They had a cat, a chapel cat, and a book for the chapel. And then from there we went to Hadrian's Wall. And Hadrian's Wall and, and um, the Housestead um, Roman Fort. <clears throat> I'm standing at the, on, at the height of the wall and looking up. Somebody took a picture of me. So you can have a sense of how high it is. It's not, um, in these places where there are people on it, there are places where you can actually climb up onto it. Um, I don't think it would be that di difficult to traverse, uh, but they did have, they had uh, places all the way along it where they would be monitoring to make sure people didn't climb over. And here we have the Scottish borders. On one side of the stone is England, on the other side of the stone is Scotland. And then I visited the National Museum of Scotland, and this sign was there, as long as only 100 of us remain alive, we will never, on any conditions, be brought under English rule. So that is still at the back of the hearts of the Scots. And in the this is the foyer in the as you come in. It's spectacular, and in it you've got this arch, uh, sort of a pergola, and to the left there is a light from a lighthouse, and there it is it's the Inchkeith Lighthouse lens, designed by David Stevenson in 1889, for the lighthouse on the island of Inchkeith in the Firth of Forth. And of course, to the right, we have Dolly, the column sheep. That's the original. She stopped. Not only did she get cold, then she got stuffed. Then she got stuffed. She got cloned, then stuffed. <laughs> and the, there, I'm not going to. I'm not going to show you much of the museum except of parts. They had a flight it part. They had a mechanics part, so they got mechanical uh, hands, and of course, the feet. Um, they have an area that is all about fish. They have an area about um, extinct animals and birds. Uh, and if you'll notice how they've created this looking as if you're actually under the ocean, those three stories or five stories of the foyer are well used around. And at the time, there was a Bonnie Prince Charlie and the Jacobites exhibit. It was fascinating, but they didn't allow any pictures inside. And the bottom left-hand corner, I thought every museum in the whole country, in the whole world, should have these. These were little chairs that were light as a feather, you could take with you anywhere in the museum, and they had them hanging everywhere, so you could sit down and look at something, rather than standing the whole time. Grand idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And here we have the Royal Mile in the rain, and what I missed was the August tattoo. And I thought, that's not bad, it was crowded enough now. And my last night was a night at the Storytellers, which was just next door to the John Knox house. 
and uh, they were amazing storytellers. They got up and they were just, <coughs> it, sounded, it sounded like they were ad-libbing, but they were excellent, excellent storytellers. And I, the only thing I regret is that I didn't record them. And that's it. So thank you very much. That was hard, and I think.